heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 304, covering the week of April 11th through April 15th, 2022. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab page, and subscribe to our YouTube page. Our YouTube page is a great resource. We're now in the process of uploading those 2021 summer school lectures. We're almost done with those, so you've got all that there, plus our Abbeville U videos, plus this podcast, plus all the old lectures that we have. It's a really great resource, so you want to get on there and get on that YouTube page. Also, you can download our free mobile app. Just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. It'll have a section. Download the app. Get the mobile app. It's free of charge. You can go to your app store, Google Play, your your Apple, your Apple, app store for Apple, and you can get the app there. You can get all our lectures on that, the podcast, it, access to the website. It's a great resource, and again, free of charge. That way you don't have to go out on your phone to your web browser and find Abbeville Institute. You can just get it through the app. It's a fantastic way to do it. While you're there at the abbevilleinstitute.org, or abbevilleinstitute.org, I should say, give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition. It's by 20 Abbeville Institute scholars, yours as a free gift just for that email list or getting on that email list. And that is our way that we communicate with you. So if you want to know about our upcoming webinars, if you want to know about our upcoming events, if you want to know about what we're doing every day at the website, then you want to be on that email list. Do not unsubscribe from that. Speaking of our upcoming events, our summer school is July 5th through 8th, 2022 at Seabrook Island, South Carolina. So hop on over to the webpage, click on events, and see all the information about that so you can go to our summer school. We really want students. So if you are a student, a graduate student, an undergraduate student, even an advanced high school student, we do have scholarships available. We want to get a number of students this year. So please contact Dr. Livingston or contact me. Uh, you can do that through the website as well. If you're interested in a scholarship, let us know you want to go. Again, you could go free of charge to the summer school. It'd be a win-win for you. So you can get great information. You'd be at the summer school, meet some like-minded people, and of course, it won't cost you a dime. So it's a great thing to do. Also, while you're at abbevilleinstitute.org, click on that uh, donate tab. We exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you like what we do, if you like the podcast, the website, all that stuff, please make a donation to the Institute. It is tax deductible to the full extent of the law. Again, it's a five, we are a 501c3 organization. So consider that tax deductible donation. Also click on the shop tab, get our logo and all kinds of cool stuff. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Let people know you like it. Share our articles on social media. We are not on Facebook, but you can still share our articles on Facebook. Go to Twitter Share our articles there. Go to Gab. Get our articles there. So lots of great ways to let people know you like what the Institute is doing. All right. And on YouTube, comment on those lectures. Share them around. Let people know you're watching those things. It's a great, great resource. All right. Well, let's talk about the last week at the Institute. And, of course, the big day was April 12th. It is a day. Another anniversary comes as April is Confederate History Month, so we, we do talk about the Confederacy, and it is a part of Southern history, though the Institute is also exploring the entirety of Southern history. It's not just the four-year period of 61 to 65. There's a lot more to the South than that, and of course a lot more to the culture and civilization of the South than just a four-year period of independence, political independence. Southern history is 400 plus years, and I think we miss that. That's why we're working on the 1607 project to try to reorient people to that fact in America. It is a bigger thing than just four years of war. But of course, the war as such defined the political principle of independence in America. You can't, if you can't leave, you're not free. Right? So we use this term liberty and freedom, and political independence is what the Declaration of Independence is all about. It's political independence for a people, at that time, North and South. And we know the founding generation wasn't opposed to, to secession because there were a number of people, first of all, they did it, and then there were a number of people in the United States, North and South, that advocated secession, even in the very immediate years after 1776, I'm sorry, after uh, 1787 and 1788 when the Constitution was ratified. We know as early as 1794, we've got Northerners talking about secession, and the Constitution only been in effect about five years, right? So, I mean, that's what we've got. We've got this period right after 
the Constitution is written where Northerners are talking about secession and independence. You're, you, you're not free if you can't leave. And so Southerners advocated a very American principle of self-determination. Secession was an American thing. If Lincoln really believed in American political principles, he would have favored secession. We know he did at one point, 1848. He favored secession in 1848 because he said as much during the Mexican War when he was in Congress from the state of Illinois. Of course, when it's his time to be president, no, 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 secession can't happen. That's illegal. I made a great political discovery, essentially, that secession, you know, the, the, states, uh, the, the states didn't predate the Union. The Union predated the states. This is what he figured out on his own, supposedly. But, of course, people like James Wilson and others had said this exact same thing, incorrectly, by the way. But So April 12th, 1861, we have the firing on Fort Sumter. But as John Morcart points out in this particular piece, our resident scholar in Japan, one of our resident scholars in Japan, as Morcourt points out, Fort Pickens was just as important as Sumter. In fact, Fort Pickens shows that the idea was not a simple resupply mission. It was a reinforcement. Fort Pickens in Florida was reinforced, not resupplied, reinforced. And there was an understanding between the, the government in Florida and the soldiers, the militia in Florida, and the federal government there, the federal soldiers there, that no action would be taken if there was no reinforcement attempted. They would just let them be until it could all be worked out. You see, Buchanan's position was one of peace. Let's work this out. Let's figure this out. You don't send any troops. We'll just have an uneasy truce here, and we'll figure out what we're going to do. Maybe there could be a negotiation. Southerners were trying to do that. In good faith, by the way. We'll buy Sumter from you. We'll buy Pickens. We'll buy these things. We'll pay you for them. We just simply want our political independence. That's what we want. And of course, the Union government refused to negotiate. If there really was a desire for peace on the part of the Republican Party or the part of Abraham Lincoln, it could have all been solved before the war. Lincoln was telling Republicans on the Committee of 13, which had opportunities to solve the entire sectional crisis, Jefferson Davis, who was the chairman of the Committee of 13, would have voted for the Crittenden Compromise had not all the Republicans been opposed to it. See, that's the dirty little secret. Davis uh, implemented a policy of majority. So for any compromise proposal to pass, it had to have a majority of the Democrats and the Republicans on the committee. Lincoln is writing to these Republicans, don't compromise on anything. The Critton Compromise probably would have passed in a plebiscite if you put it up to the people of the United States in 1860. I can almost guarantee you it would have passed. American public would have said, yeah, we'll go for that because it would have extended the Missouri Compromise line out to California. California could have remained a free state, but it would have simply extended Missouri Compromise out. And Jefferson Davis and the Democrats, all the Democrats, many Southerners, would have voted for this. In fact, they did, but switched their votes, two of them, because the Republicans were all against it at the insistence of Abraham Lincoln, who's running around as he's president-elect saying, we're not going to compromise with the South. We won't do it. Now, Lincoln, of course, as president, as Daniel Crofts has pointed out, favored the original 13th Amendment, the Corwin Amendment. In fact, he calls it more like the Lincoln Amendment. But as people pointed out even during that debate, this isn't the issue. Nobody's saying that the Republican Party is going to abolish slavery in the southern states. That's not the issue at all. The issue is the territories. The issue is the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has ruled in Dred Scott that slavery is allowed in the territories. And now you're saying that it's not. You're not going to abide by a Supreme Court decision. Lincoln speaks of law, the rule of law, yet he didn't favor the rule of law because if he did, he would have supported the Supreme Court decision. Right? But he doesn't. So the issue was the territories. Now, again, in 2022, we can look back at this and say, gosh, this is a terrible thing to be drawing a line in the sand and dying on that hill, if that's it. Right? If that slavery in the territories. But it was more theoretical to the to Southerners than anything else. Most of them did not think that slavery was really going to flourish in the desert Southwest. Uh, there was some question about this. I mean, there were some Southerners who viewed the institution as adaptable anywhere. They thought it could work in industrial cities situations. They thought it could work in desert situations. They thought it could work anywhere. And of course, 
they could they were looking at potentially places in South America to add states to the United States. You can go back to the All of Mexico movement, which thankfully was rejected. Uh, by the way, John C. Calhoun, the defender of slavery, as Samuel Flagg Bemis calls him, was against the All of Mexico movement. Uh, but regardless, uh, there was some, of course, some talk among some imperialist Southerners that they wanted to expand south into other parts of the United States. Cuba was a target. Nicaragua was a target. This is clear, right? This stuff happened. But the fact is, this was more of a theoretical thing than anything else. They Southerners wanted to ensure that the Northerners, that Republicans would abide by tradition and custom and not come in and bulldoze and wreck everything. You see, uh, Lincoln was an ideologue. Southerners were traditional. And Davis would have compromised. The United States majority would have compromised. You look at Lincoln only getting 39% of the popular vote. 60% 60% of the people were against Lincoln. And in those 60%, you had John Breckinridge, who was against uh, the actions of northern states opposing the fugitive slave law. And he was in favor of the Crittenden Compromise. You had John Bell, who was in favor of the Crittenden Compromise. And you had Stephen Douglas, who wasn't necessarily in favor of the Crittenden Compromise, though he still believed in popular sovereignty. And but so he was in a position that was diametrically opposed to the Republicans. So 60% of the population voted for people that would have supported something like the Crittenden Compromise. 39% of the people voted for someone who was against it. Where is the majority? It's on the other side, right? So Lincoln wasn't in favor of saving the Union, and Democrats and Southerners weren't necessarily in favor of. Uh, a slave power, because even if you extend the Missouri Compromise line, what's going to happen? You've got basically the states of what? Arizona, New Mexico. I mean, that's it. That's all you've got. There's nothing else. Texas is already, I mean, you, you got nothing else really. Texas is already in the union. Now, um, this is the thing that everyone misses. The issue was not slavery already existed. Southerners didn't think Congress could do anything about that, though John C. Calhoun certainly thought they could. But Southerners really didn't think anything could come out of that. And when you look at the debates about secession, those that were against it in the South are saying slavery has never been better protected than it is right now in the United States. There's Nothing's going to happen to change that. If we leave, it's going to be worse because if we lose, then it could be abolished. I mean, anything can happen. And of course, that's exactly what did happen. So the Unionists were much, I mean, they're saying, look, we want to protect slavery. If that's it, we got to stay in the Union. So anyways, April 12th, big date in American history. Also a big date, uh, not just because of Fort Sumter. Also, it's the day that Franklin Roosevelt died in Warm Springs, Georgia. Kind of interesting little tidbit there. But uh, So we had that great piece by John Moore Court. And of course, corresponding with that is Clyde Wilson's piece, his conclusion of the six-part series on uh, on the institution of slavery in America. And he wraps up great piece, uh, A Dangerous Rock Rolling Downhill, and he points out that really I mean, the whole point of all of this, the whole point of everything that we're doing in America right now and talking about slavery and discussing slavery, it's, there's a political agenda behind it. Because if we really had a, a, a real inquisit, or inquiry on slavery, we're really out there and we have an inquiry on slavery. We're, we're discussing slavery, we're looking at slavery. If we're really doing that, like Fogel and Engerman or Genovese or others, if we're really doing that, then we're going to come up with some conclusions that are far different than what we're getting out of the 1619 Project or mainstream media or anything else, right? Even if you go back and look at 12 Years a Slave, there was a journal article written years ago, I think in the 1980s, mid-1980s, by a number of, this is, a, this is academic historians. And they concluded, they said, look, we have to be very careful of these slave narratives because they're always written by abolitionists through the lens of abolitionists, and they embellish everything. And you have to be careful with that. Some of the things you can probably say are pretty accurate. Some of the things you can't. 
This is why Nehemiah Adams traveling to the South and writing his journal as an abolitionist, as he went to the South and he said, wait a second here, it's not like anything you people up North are saying. This is completely different. I, I, I've seen it firsthand. Now you could say, well, they're going to show them the best side. They're not going to show them the worst stuff. That's probably true. There's, there's, I mean, they're not going to go out and show him anything bad because they're trying to put on a good show, right? Because they know what he's going to do. He's going to write about it. But that said, where is the evidence at times to make these outlandish accusations that people make about Southerners in the 1850s in particular? Eugene Genovese says, look, yeah, there was abuse. Absolutely. It happened. Everyone knows it happened. But to say it was still happening in the 1850s? That's preposterous. People had already, there was already an F evidence of reform at that point. People were certainly uh, less inclined to do horrible things to slaves than they had been before because they knew the world was watching. And so, yeah, you could find stuff. You could find abuse. There's no doubt about it. It was the worst part of the system. The, the, just the propensity, the possibility for abuse was what made slavery inhuman, right? And uh, that, that's, I mean, it's what people talked about in the South. You know, it's, it's very hard to be a slave owner because it brings out the worst in you at times. It's just not a good institution to have. It makes people do horrible things. And I think that's where, you know, we have to understand it. But uh, to say that Southerners were demons, I mean, it's, it's ahistorical. And I think that's what Clyde's trying to do here in this six-part series. And some of the best men in America were slave owners. It's just a fact. And that's just something that if you're a real historian, okay, that's what they were. We don't say anything about Aristotle. Or we don't say anything about the, well, I mean, the Romans or the Greeks. The, all the Greeks were slave owners. Yet we can... We can talk about how great the Greeks were. We can talk about Rome and the greatness of the Roman government and political institutions. Yet, the Romans had a horrible slaveholding society. I mean, one of the worst in history. But, you know, it doesn't matter because they built these great rooms. People go and walk, oh, this is amazing. Look at all this great stuff in Rome. Let's go to Athens. Look at all the great stuff. The Athenians were slave owners. The Spartans were slave owners. All of them. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. These are great people. Southerners, no. No, they're all demons. All horrible people. See, it's not necessarily the institution of slavery they're opposing. It's the idea of race-based slavery um, because of the legacy of race in America and what race has meant. But, I mean, it, it, look, that's the issue more than anything else. Uh, and... There were white slaves. I mean, these are things that we talked about last week with Holacek's article. There were white slaves, a lot of them. There were Indian slaves, a lot of them. So slavery was an institution and bigger than that. And of course, we know that former slaves who went back to Africa through the colonization project enslaved the Africans, right? So slavery is bigger than just race. And we know that Africans themselves were dominating the trade and determining the prices and capturing the people to be sold into slavery. All this is well known. It doesn't matter because that doesn't fit a political agenda. So these first two pieces that uh, this past week were just fantastic. And since it is um, Easter week, we had another great piece from Brandon Meeks this week titled Dirt. And I, I want to read it, but I also want to, before I do that, talk about the piece on Friday, The Pride of Kentucky and Maryland about bourbon. You see... One of the things about the South and Southern culture is, is its food. And one of the things that is often pointed out with the South, you know, it's, um, uh, it's the, the mint julep, right? The mint julep. Uh, and so, well, the Southerners sitting around drinking their mint juleps. But mint juleps were a, an art, and I think this piece by Joyce Bennett really brings that out. I mean, it's so good. Um, and of course, she points back to Maryland as one of the great uh, outlets for mint juleps. Of course, it's off in Kentucky. But she actually has a letter. And I want to read this letter, too. 
Um, it's a letter by S.B. Buckner Jr., Simon, Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr. Now, Simon Bolivar Buckner was a Confederate general, and he was also the vice presidential candidate for the National Democratic Party in 1896. But his son writes this in 1937 from Maryland. He says, My dear General, your letter requesting my formula for mixing mint juleps leaves me in the same position in which Captain Barber found himself when asked how he was able to carve the image of an elephant from a block of wood. He replied that it was a simple process consisting merely in whittling off the part that didn't look like an elephant. The preparation of the quintessence of gentlemanly beverages can be described only in like terms. A mint julep is not the product of a formula. It is a ceremony. It must be performed by a gentleman possessing a true sense of the artistic, a deep reverence for the ingredients, and a proper appreciation of the occasion. It is a rite that must not be entrusted to a novice, a statistician, nor a Yankee. It is a heritage of the Old South, an emblem of hospitality and a vehicle in which noble minds can travel together upon the flower strewn paths of happy and congenial thought. I love that paragraph. Because what Buckner does there, of course, is say it's about tradition. It's about tradition. And Yankees can't do it. Statisticians can't do it. Novices certainly can't do it. But you, it's a right. And it's a sense of the artistic. It's like a poem to do it properly. And noble minds have to travel together upon the flowers strewn paths of happy and congenial thought. What a beautiful paragraph. Fantastic. So far as the mere mechanics of the operation are concerned, the procedure, stripped of its ceremonial embellishments, can be described as follows. Go to a spring where a cool, crystal clear water bubbles from under a bank of dew washed ferns. In a consecrated vessel, dip up a little water at the source. Follow the stream through its banks of green moss and wildflowers until it broadens and trickles through beds of mint, growing in aromatic profusion and waving softly in the summer breeze. Gather the sweetest and tenderest shoots and gently carry them home. Go to the sideboard and select a decanter of finest bourbon, distilled by a master hand, mellow with age yet still vigorous and inspiring. An ancestral sugar bowl, a row of silver goblets, some spoons and some ice, and you are ready to start. In a canvas bag, pound twice as much ice as you think you will need. Make it as fine as snow. Keep it dry and do not allow it to denigrate, I'm sorry, degenerate into slush. In each goblet, put a slightly heaping teaspoonful of granulated sugar. Barely cover this with spring water and slightly bruise one mint leaf into this, leaving a spoon in the goblet. Then pour elixir from the decanter until the goblets are about one-fourth full. Fill the goblets with snowy ice, sprinkling a small amount of sugar as you fill. Wipe the outside of the goblets dry and embellish conspicuously, I'm sorry, and spell this copiously with mint, excuse me. Then comes the important and delicate operation of frosting. By proper manipulation of the spoon, the ingredients are circulated and blended until nature, wishing to take a further hand and add another of its beautiful phenomenon, encrusts the whole in a glistening coat of white frost. This harmoniously blended by the deft touches of a skilled hand, you have a beverage appropriate for honorable men and beautiful women. When all is ready, assemble your guests on the porch or in the garden where the aroma of the juleps will rise heavenward and make the birds sing. Propose a well-worthy toast, bury your nose in the mint, inhale a deep breath of its fragrance, and sip the nectar of the gods. Being overcome by thirst, I can write no further. I mean, the description is beautiful. Beautiful. That's why I love this piece. That letter alone was worthy of publication. So we're going to wrap up the week with another very good piece by Brandon Meeks, entitled Dirt. Great piece on an Easter Sunday. He says, When I was a boy, I was convinced that when God decided to make the world, he started with Arkansas. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers were merely nicknames for the mighty Mississippi that hammed in the corner of the Delta. And the first man, Adam, likely lived somewhere between West Memphis and the Louisiana line. After all, the good book was quite emphatic. The Lord formed man out of, of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The preacher man at our local missionary Baptist church often waxed eloquent on the subject as his forehand, forehead gleamed and 
Small tufts of foam grew on the edges of his mouth like the bright white cotton bulbs in the fields around the meeting house. Adam was, God, was God's first field hand, he once said. The Lord made him out of deep red delta clay and then set him to work tending the garden. Before anything else, God made, me, God made a farmer. He brought man alive out of the dirt and then he taught that man how to get life out of the ground for himself. Later I would realize, poetic license notwithstanding, that Brother Preacher was right. The Almighty and noble both field and farmer in an act of creation. Man was begotten of the dirt, sustained by the fruit of the ground, and one day finds himself resting from his labors beneath the cool sod. This is probably why I've always felt so at home when digging around in my own native soil, as though getting dirty was a way of making peace with the totality of history of the side of the resurrection. Just as God planted a garden eastward in Eden, Grandmother planted her own piece of paradise around an ancient live oak tree in the front yard. Granddaddy hauled in four railway ties and sanded them down smooth so to rid them of creosote and splinters. These fit snugly around the base of the proud oak tree that, like one of those wooden shoes the Dutch are so partial to. Then there was Grandmother on her knees in the dirt, her head bowed as she turned the black earth with her small hand of shovel, like she was praying that heaven would let her borrow a bit of beauty for her forgotten corner of the world. And it was that if heaven answered through a wink of sunshine and the arms of the massive oak stretched bit forth in benediction. Then one morning she woke up to find a routine of birds' foot viol violets, black-eyed Susans, blue larkspurs, and springs of butterfly weed, and congregating around the tree like so many acolytes all dressed up for an Easter sunrise service. But I am Adam's natural heir. Our relationship with gardens is complicated. As soon as she turned me loose, I set upon grandmother's flower bed with a wide spoon, two Tonka dump trucks, and a half dozen or small, so small race cars. At first, I dug ditches around the flowers, but the, but the bees became a nuisance, so I began felling black-eyed Susans like pulpwood and stacking them by the cord on the backs of the small yellow trucks. I dug past topsoil and thick clay. I tunneled under the now naked roots of the elderly oak, I pushed my way through worms and other squiggly critters as I searched for the bottom of the world. I was halfway to Shanghai when I heard my grandmother gasp, then holler, then plop down on her backside on the doorstep in a fit of laughter. It hadn't dawned on me that it, she might be mad. I loved dirt, and dirt was for digging. I beamed brighter than the butterfly weed, and I think that was enough. Though she never planted flowers there again, she always had a garden. Not a garden to look at, a garden to live on. Now there's a certain kind of person who finds in this some romantic notion, but that kind of person has never had palms full of blisters from hours spent with a hoe in their hand. Whatever word you may use to describe squaring off with a copperhead who has become territorial over your butter beans, idyllic isn't it. And there's nothing particularly picturesque about being sent out in the dark on the night of the night to pee in a rusty Folgers can so as, so as to keep the deer from eating the, up the turnip greens. But it's fair to say that I've spent a large part of my life in the dirt, digging, learning, living. And just this morning I went out to pray over the spot that will soon be seeded with summer squash and English peas and greens and okra and peppers. It will taste better than that store-bought too. It always does. Planted by your own hand, watered by your own sweat, gathered from your own dirt. It is better. Whenever I'm in the garden, I always think first about grandmother's flower bed. Then I think about flowering her down, following her down, rows of peas and beans, plucking bushes and filling baskets. I think of the deep magic involved in turning dirt and dead seeds into lunch and supper and life. I think, too, of those whom I have loved and who have been planted in a quiet place until the last spring comes, and they shall burst forth, blossoming as a rose. I feel the dirt between my fingers, and I think of paradise lost, and paradise found, and paradise yet to come. But mostly, I think about grandmothers sitting on those steps, laughing and shaking her head, as I dug around in her beautiful flowers. And I half suspect that God sits on the front steps of heaven doing the same thing. Until next time, good day. Mm -hmm.